Let's welcome in our guest. We have uh, Pankaj Moradkar. He's market expert joining us now. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Pankaj. Uh, where do you think the market is headed? And uh, what do you think is going to do well from here on? Everybody says it's going to be more stock specific from here on. Uh, but what's the right strategy when it comes to investing in the right stocks? I think the outlook for market remains fairly sanguine from here on. Uh, essentially, uh, to put things in context, if you see, uh, you know, index has not gone anywhere over the last uh, 18 months or so. And at the same time, uh, uh, you know, uh, we've seen some uptick in the growth in the economy, though it did get impacted by the recent uh, demonetization and its after effect. But now we are well through, uh, you know, overcoming that. So I think... Uh, to put things in context, over the last three years, we have seen significant improvement in, in, in India's macroeconomic balances. India probably has one of the strongest macroeconomic, uh, you know, fundamentals across, if you look at countries across the globe. And with improving growth outlook globally, uh, I think India should be a big beneficiary of uplift in global growth. And at the same time, uh, the pointers to growth domestically are also equally strong. So I think we should see a sharp recovery in the economy going into the next uh, financial year and the year after. And that should bode well for uh, equities, which essentially is a growth asset class. Right. Uh, so you think the market's outlook is good. Uh, from here on, um, what will be the positive trigger uh, for stocks and for markets? Because we've seen the budget done in dusted weight. Uh, the RBI's policy was one uh, where the stance was changed from account accommodative to neutral. Where are the positive triggers coming in? Do you think the GST is going to provide the next trigger? The expectation is that it's going to be more disruptive in the um, post its uh, initiation for a few quarters. So where is the positive trigger coming from? I think there are lots of uh, them around the corner. First and foremost is uh, the fact that uh, our growth is at a, such a low point from an overall economy point of view that we'll see an uptick in growth and growth is the biggest trigger for a growth asset like equity. So economic growth is going to be the first and the foremost trigger. Uh, secondly, more importantly, I think uh, we, uh, uh, despite RBI uh, setting a pause on the rates, uh, I think the rates are now at, a, uh, you know, at such a low point that uh, it's a huge significant trigger for equities as an asset class in terms of relative uh, valuations uh, versus fixed income. And uh, uh, you touched upon GST. I think, oh, yeah, that's, a, uh, that's going to be a very big uh, driver for growth going forward, though it might lead to some uh, uh, disruptions for the first few quarters. But I think we should put things in context. This is one of those reforms which has been in the making for the last 10 years you know so finally when it comes i think markets are not going to look at the next few quarters in terms of the disruption it causes but the benefit that will accrue to the economy as a whole to the government and to the corporate sector probably over the medium term and that can be very significant uh, you know uh, gst by itself can add about a percentage point to uh, overall aggregate gdp growth uh, over the medium term and once you get through those initial disruption period then the benefits of it over the next three to five years can be very significant uh, you know so i think uh, all of them uh, uh, points towards you know uh, a pro uh, probably a brighter outlook for equities as an asset class also uh, please bear in mind that Corporate profitability today is at the lowest point it has ever been in the uh, cycle. Corporate profits are about 4.5% of uh, <coughs> aggregate GDP, which is clearly uh, the lowest that we've ever seen in the economy. So whenever we see an uptick or recovery in the growth in the economy, we'll see a uh, significant uptick in corporate profitability. And that coupled with you know reasonable valuations and lower interest rates should be, a, should be a strong driver for equities as an asset class going forward. How much uh, importance would you give to flows and sentiment? Now, domestic flows have been strong uh, for the last few months when FII buying has been very muted. How important are flows? Uh, because, you know, uh, a lot of focus uh, now on developed markets like the US, we've heard uh, Donald Trump say that he's going to come up with tax reforms. Uh, do you think that flows will re uh, remain muted in uh, India? Uh, can domestic flows, uh, you know, help support the market? Well, uh, I think one, uh, domestic flows will continue to remain strong because uh, probably equities is the best opportunity 
uh, for uh, domestic savings. Uh, fixed income, uh, because of the decline in interest rates sharply, is not attractive as an asset class anymore. And clearly, real estate uh, is one sector which used to absorb a lot of domestic savings has clearly not delivered uh, any meaningful returns over the last uh, couple of years and the outlook isn't uh, good uh, either. Uh, so I think uh, 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 an equity as an asset class apart from the liquidity factor is probably one which will give superior returns to any other competing asset class and that should be and the fact remains that the penetration of equities amongst household savings is significantly low. So domestic flows into equities will continue to remain strong. But at the same time, uh, you know, I also believe that uh, uh, FI flows into Indian equities will also continue to remain strong. While we'll see a growth recovery in uh, US, uh, but I don't think so that will change the course of flows into a uh, uh, country like India because foreigners investing into India are taking a more strategic view of India which is more like 5 year, 10 year and they clearly think uh, that uh, India is one of uh, one of the very few large economies which can grow at a very high rate on a sustainable basis over a long period of time. So India presents a very compelling investment case from a global investor's point of view and for a emerging market or a Asian market investor, it's one of those uh, investment case which they can't afford to ignore. All right. Uh, how important will uh, the upcoming state elections be for sentiment? Because the markets have run uh, ahead I mean, pretty fast. Uh, do you think they are risk because of uh, the state elections? Um, you know, growth could be good. But for uh, talking about stock markets that have run up so much, uh, would you exercise some caution? Yeah, uh, see, sentiments are very fickle. You know, they like the weather, they change every day. So uh, some of these election results and nuances can have an impact for a couple of days or a week or so or over the next 5% move on the markets. But I think what matters for a long-term investor is more uh, the medium-term and the longer-term outlook. So if at all there is any pullback or correction in the markets, either because of uh, some election outcome or or, or uh, maybe because of the fact that over the last six weeks, markets have risen pretty sharply, uh, you know, uh, uh, and a lot of people have been left on the sidelines. I think long-term investors should use any of those corrections as an opportunity to step into the market or to invest into the market. So I think any correction into Indian equities is an opportunity to invest into it from a medium term to longer term. view. Right. You know, say if there's a correction in the market of about 4-5%, uh, maybe, you know, over the next 2-3 to three months. Then if you start to look at the 10-year GSEC yields in India, and then you start to compare the earnings growth, you think earnings growth by far will look better? Uh, I would think so. So over the last, uh, you know, six years, because of the multiple headwinds that we have faced, earnings growth have been in low single digits. And in fact, over the last three years, four years, they've actually lagged even the nominal GDP growth. That essentially shows the compression in earnings that we've seen in the corporate India because of the multiple headwinds uh, that the corporate India has been facing. But uh, now I think we are at a stage where most of the headwinds are behind us. And as we see recovery in the growth in the economy, earnings will accelerate at a much faster pace than the uh, nominal GDP growth. And that by itself should be a significant uh, you know, driver for equities uh, performance. Right. Let's talk about some stocks and sectors, uh, Pankaj. So, you know, pharma and IT are two sectors which have done very well in the last few years. Earnings growth on a YOY basis has been good. Uh, but uh, the stocks have not performed at least in the last 18 months. Do you think now the earnings growth would start to come back and uh, that's the time when these names could be contra buys? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, both the sectors are more globally linked than domestically linked because a large part of their earnings uh, comes from... Uh, global markets uh, uh, essentially and India has uh, created some of the finest global companies in these sectors but uh, when you look at both the sectors let's say in case of uh, IT sector uh, the challenge they certainly face some cyclical headwinds to their business one clearly there is a significant disruption that's happening in the IT spends itself because <coughs> client spends are more <coughs> directed towards digital technologies and uh, uh, as this shift in technology is undergoing, uh, the Indian companies are facing uh, significant disruption in the existing business in terms of the way the pricing in their business works. The pricing on the existing business is on a significant downward trajectory and I think that will continue for probably next couple of years. Uh, you know, uh, uh, shift in technology happens in the IT sector every uh, you know, every decade and this time around, uh, the point is that Indian companies for the first time are the incumbents, you know, as opposed to 
uh, the IBMs and uh, the Accentures of the world. So clearly they have certain cyclical headwinds going forward and plus on top of that you have some rhetoric from the new government in terms of uh, in US in terms of what it wants to do in terms of uh, restrictions on immigration and so on and so forth. So I think we need to watch out for that. So uh, while they are great companies with superior business models and I, I'm sure they'll do well over a longer period of time, but I think from a more from a next two to four quarters, they might still have cyclical headwinds to their earnings and the earnings growth will be muted. Right. And as far as valuations are concerned, does that already factor a very muted growth? Oh yeah, I think valuations have corrected significantly. So that's already priced in or to a significant extent that's priced in. But I think uh, while immigration uh, challenges uh, will be more near term and I, I, I think the companies are capable of dealing with it, uh, what's more uh, 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 challenging for these companies is the disruption that's happening in the business. And clearly again, I think the Indian IT companies have shown time and again that whenever these kind of disruptions happen, they have demonstrated the ability to innovate and deal with it and emerge uh, uh, you know, uh, out of it uh, with their skill sets. Uh, and investments into the new technologies and I think they will demonstrate that this time as well but it might take its own time. Right, then let's just talk about pharma and the pricing pressure over there. You think valuations there are not factoring in? We still have Sun, Lupin which are not delivering great set of numbers but at the same time, you know, the valuations are still high. I think valuations have moderated significantly uh, over the last, you know, uh, six quarters or so. Uh, the fact remains that again there uh, there is significant uh, price erosion that's happening in the base business or in the generic US generic space. Uh, but having said that, I still think that if you take a medium term uh, outlook, then Indian companies are clearly moving up uh, significantly up the value chain from generics to specialty generics and complex generics companies. And uh, they have been making significant uh, investments into their R&D pipeline and in terms of their filings. And I think as this transition happens uh, and they move up the value chain, I think the longer term outlook for these companies remains still remains very promising. Though they again have some cyclical headwinds for the next few quarters in terms of their earnings. Right. Uh, in pharma, are valuations factoring in the worst? I would I, I, I see it's very difficult to point at any point of time whether the valuations are factored in the worst and what the worst case scenario, but uh, it's fair to say that uh, you know uh, valuations are moderated significantly and they are far more reasonable in the context of the growth that these companies are expected to deliver over the next uh, few years. You know, so I don't see uh, valuations as being too rich or expensive in that sense. Right. Let's talk about corporate banking space. Now, till now, the retail banking space in the last four or five years has been a compounding story. But only retail cannot just grow. I mean, only consumption cannot grow. Even manufacturing has to grow. And only then, you know, you would see more money into the retailer's hands. Uh, do you think that uh, corporate banks should do well? A lot has been uh, uh, announced for uh, better bankruptcy codes, better, uh, b better, you know, reasoning to lend. So do you think corporate banks will do very well once, uh, once you know, the debt issues are behind? So clearly corporate banks have been impaired uh, because of the uh, issues which we've had with the various sectors of the economy, be it the, you know, the entire infrastructure sector uh, across different segments of infra. We've had significant challenges uh, that companies have faced and in turn all the problems today or challenges were lying on the balance sheet of corporate banks. Uh, a good part of that has been or a significant part of that is uh, known or disclosed now than what uh, then was the case about three years back. But I think they still have a fair degree of, uh, you know, provisioning to do, uh, which will probably happen over the next uh, three, four quarters. So uh, I think uh, the biggest challenge for the economy is that the private sector investment cycle remains elusive. Uh, we need, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are not enough corporates uh, who are willing to invest into new capacities. Uh, and at the same time, corporate banks have been, uh, you know, um, do not have the balance sheet strength to probably uh, lend to new uh, projects. But I think over the next two, three quarters, as some of these challenges, uh, you know, uh, uh, are passed through or we overcome that hump, then probably at least on the private sector side, I think the corporate banks uh, would do well. But do you think uh, in terms of corporate banking valuation, so earlier it was the difference between PSU and private banks. Now it's the difference between corporate and retail banks. Do you think that difference has already played out? So the street is already giving retail banks a big premium? Yeah, that's true. But I think that will always continue because on a retail business, if you look on a risk, uh, one, the risk of the business is significantly lower and the risk suggested returns for retail banks are far superior to uh, you know the corporate banks and the retail business far less cyclical in that sense. 
versus a uh, corporate business uh, corporate business so i think retail banks will continue to enjoy uh, that uh, premium because of the superior uh, risk and the superior return risk adjusted returns that emerge out of that business so uh, while the valuation gap could narrow somewhat but i think that uh, retail banks will always continue to trade at premium to corporates right can you talk about nbfcs last 8 months most of the nbfcs have re-rated any particular reason that you can see I think uh, if you see over the last four or five years, they've done a phenomenal job, uh, meaning all these NBFCs have a very strong distribution franchise. And they've done a, uh, I think, exceedingly uh, phenomenal job in terms of leveraging the distribution franchise and at the same time uh, running a very efficient uh, operation and at the same time managing the asset quality quite well. So I think they are a great distribution franchise. Uh, and uh, as a result, the sum total, it delivers uh, uh, you know, uh, a very solid value to the stakeholders. So, uh, I think well-run NBFCs who have uh, very efficient operations and who manage the asset quality well will continue to do well. Right, uh, Pankaj, uh, the, uh, the rupee has strengthened. It's now trading at a three-month high. Um, you know, uh, when we were closer to 68, everybody said look out for 70 rupees to a dollar, maybe even by March. Where do you think the currency is headed? And uh, do you think uh, uh, if you look across to the US, uh, the decline in the dollar is now over? If there is a fiscal stimulus uh, coming through, we're already hearing talk about uh, tax reform coming through. Uh, do you think uh, the rupee, this is as good as it gets for the rupee, it's going to weaken f uh, again from here on? What would you do with some of the export-oriented uh, 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 names that are listed? Well, uh, so I'm not a currency expert, but I'll give you my view. Clearly, uh, the rupee is overvalued. If you look at, look at it on a... Uh, R E E R basis clearly rupee is overvalued by five to seven percent. The recent up move in the rupee over the last few days has also been, I think, triggered by the RBI policy action where they've changed the monetary stance from uh, uh, monetary stance to neutral. So that's worked in favor of the currency. And clearly, uh, uh, meaning if you look at last year, uh, while uh, in the backdrop of or the last uh, four months in the backdrop of a strengthening dollar, uh, you know, probably rupee has been one of the more, uh, uh, amongst the one of the best or the better performing currencies. So, uh, and I think that's nothing but a reflection of uh, the strong macroeconomic fundamentals uh, that India has. But at the same point of time, I think uh, it is about seven to eight percent overvalued when you look at it. From a RER perspective, some point of time, I think the uh, you know uh, uh, we'll have to uh, let it go because otherwise it will erode uh, uh, export competitiveness competitiveness of Indian companies. But I still think uh, if you take a slightly more medium-term view, then rupee probably will be amongst one of the more stable currencies as compared to a lot of other competing uh, uh, you know currencies or countries because uh, the strong and stable macroeconomic fundamentals that India has. Uh, uh, I think as far as companies across sectors are concerned, be it IT or farm or other exporters, uh, uh, they'll have to readjust or uh, adjust their businesses to the prevailing currencies. And more importantly, I think uh, it's good for uh, uh, those companies if we have a stable currency rather than a currency which is far more volatile and then they f find it difficult to ma uh, deal with it. So a stable, a stable currency is far more, uh, you know, uh, uh, is, uh, is what is required. By, uh, by businesses and corporates and that's what uh, uh, the trend rupee has been demonstrating over the last couple of years and I think it will continue to remain so. Pankaj, what I wanted to find out from you is how would you view some of these export oriented companies, not necessarily just pharma and IT. Uh, you know, IT has a large market in the US, but the business is changing. But we have some auto component makers that have a large presence in the US, uh, auto companies uh, that have, uh, you know, sales in the US, uh, some of the metal names also that have some interest in the US. So if that economy starts growing much faster, do you think prospects? of these companies will inc will improve would you look at buying some of these names well uh, so uh, when you look at uh, you know uh, from an investing perspective uh, uh, while we do have certain companies across autos and some other sectors which are big exporters out of india but there are very few companies who have done it 
well uh, when it comes to uh, global markets and uh, but uh, i think if the there's an uptick in global economy certainly these companies will benefit and one would like to look at them but at the same time i think uh, we also need to be conscious of the fact in terms of there is an unknown uh, variable out there in terms of the new government in place in us and what the new president wants to do uh, in terms of uh, you know dealing with all those uh, uh, you know uh, uh, <coughs> all those exporters and trade deals uh, uh, this thing so i think one need to watch out for that in terms of what uh, the new government in the us uh, does and what does that mean for uh, it's not an india specific issue but i think it's a more issue to do with global trade uh, so how how that impacts these companies right um what's your view then on some of the pharma and uh, pharma names uh, i think the business is changing uh, but pharma has its own issues and uh, you know some of those uh, issues may get exemplified of because of the policy in the us their stock of you know uh, bidding uh, for uh, generic drugs and price bidding may impact pharma companies who in any case are facing a lot of competitive pressures how would you view some of the pharmaceutical names uh, any buys there uh well i think you know the us generic space has always been a very competitive space it's not been easy to uh, you know uh, be there and compete so uh, the competition has always been there it's not been anything new probably what we always uh, uh, incrementally seen is probably there is somewhat uh, accelerated price erosion that's happening in the generic business over the last few quarters and at the same time there is a channel consolidation which is playing out in the us uh, distribution space and as a result the generics companies are getting impacted on both sides on one side on the pricing side and on the second side with a strong stronger bargaining power which the distributors <coughs> are having but having said that you know i still think the outlook for indian healthcare industry remains very promising from a medium term perspective because uh, uh, indian companies are moving up the value chain from being plain vanilla generics company to specialty and complex generics and the uh, 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 while these companies are indian companies but their businesses are truly global and probably we have created some of the finest global healthcare companies out of india Uh, uh clearly i don't see meaning i i think uh, there is every possibility that probably we'll have the largest global generics company out of uh, india in the next 3 to 5 years and some of those indian companies are already making the kind of investments will which will take them to that kind of a uh, uh, you know size and scale so i think the medium term to longer term outlook for healthcare remains very promising uh over the next few quarters uh, probably next two to four quarters some of these companies might still have some headwinds because of generic price erosion uh but i think uh, any decline uh, in stock prices during this period should be used as an opportunity for a longer term investors to invest into those businesses are there any themes or names where you think uh, a large re rating is on the anvil maybe telecom you know if consolidation takes place uh auto uh, components um, tires anything that you where you see a large re rating uh, that is due <coughs> sorry i i i am pretty constructive on the telecom as a sector because i think we are in the last leg of the competitive intensity of the sector probably at some point of time this will abate and what will essentially have now is a sector which is far more consolidated with about four odd players and uh, uh, all the headwinds that the sector has faced over the last 7 uh, 8 years is in, in terms of uh, uh, regulatory changes in terms of spectrum auctions are all clearly behind us if uh, india has to emerge uh, you know as one of the fastest growing economies and a shift has, has to happen towards the digital economy then i think uh, all of that will ride on back of the Uh, telcos because they essentially provide you the connectivity so i think uh, clearly we are uh, uh, reaching a stage where we are towards the end of the competitive intensity and the regulatory hurdles as for the telecom sector is concerned and if one were to take a slightly more longer term view that is over the next 3 to 5 years i think the outlook for the sector is promising so for me it's a sector that one should certainly look for, uh, invest into right say if the consolidation happens and again not taking names of you know any other company uh but if the consolidation happens and number 2 and 3 come together and they become number 1 you think industry dynamics can change quite meaningfully see i think they've already changed uh, yeah uh, because today in terms of pricing probably india has the lowest global pricing uh, uh that exists anywhere in the world 
uh, all these companies have already made significant investments one into the spectrum uh, which will last them for the next 20 years they they have and they are making investments into the networks uh, uh, on the ground uh, uh, barring the top three or four players everyone is bleeding uh, you know uh, and bankers are not willing to fund uh, any uh, any of these companies. So I think the sector has reached a stage where, uh, you know, uh, uh, barring the top three companies, everyone else is on the uh, brink kind of thing. And uh, things can't deteriorate from here. So I think the dynamics have changed and they've changed significantly. Uh, uh, from here on, as growth recovers into the sector, uh, which it will, I think, over the next few years and over the longer term, I think... Uh, uh, the top three or four guys uh, will certainly do well. Right. You know, uh, just about the rates and the, I mean, the tariff rates of telecom companies. Now, tariff rates of telecom companies have always been going down since inception. Uh, right now, as you said, that it's one of the lowest. Say from 30 paisa, if a company increases uh, and uh, makes it about 45 paisa or 1 rupee, whenever the pricing power comes back, should it be looked as a 50% hike? which can change the EBITDA estimates quite meaningfully? Or you would still say that, you know, from 15 rupees, we are still just at about 45 paisa or 1 rupee? So I think, uh, you know, these companies are uh, uh, very smart enough in terms of how they run their business. So what eventually will happen is you will not see a significant uptick in the headline pricing, uh, which these companies report. But at the same time, what matters to these companies is the... Uh, ARPUs as they call it or the average revenue per user you know but they have various other means and ways of taking uh, more money out of customers wallet and we've seen the same thing when the inflection point happened in the voice business that while uh, you know uh, headline uh, tariff rates declined but the average revenue per user kept on rising because consumers were using more and more of it and uh, these companies were clocking sharp revenue growth. So I think something similar will happen uh, as the data story unfolds. So headline tariff might still not go up very sharply, but yet these companies know, uh, they know how to take more money out of the consumer wallet. And as a result, their average revenue per user will keep going up. And that is what matters to them, the absolute dollar amount rather than the rate. Right. Uh, so that was a view on telecom. Just a word on the metals and cement pack as well. These are sectors which have done very well. However, uh, you know, uh, most of the outlook going into 2016 was that these sectors may not do well. Let's start with metals first. For 2017, again, positive on metals? So I think that's one which has clearly surprised everyone or most of the people globally because uh, the last part of the rally is not driven by actual uptake in demand globally, but more uh, one because of the reflation trade uh, that's emerging globally because of the new Trump policy or expected Trump policy and secondly because of closure of capacities in China. So while demand uptake still has been muted, uh, the drivers of the uptake in the metal prices has been more driven by some of these policy statements. We clearly need to see through as to whether China really follows through in terms of closing capacities and whether uh, uh, the new president in US makes the kind of infrastructure investments he's really talking about and whether that drives demand. So uh, I think for the time being, outlooks remain, looks remain good, but I think it will be subjected to a lot of volatility. Um, you know. Right, uh, so that was uh, for the metal packs. And for the cement pack, uh, are you surprised by the valuations that Street is giving into Ultratech or some of the other large cap players? Yeah, I would think, yeah, because uh, some of these names are actually trading at valuations which are rich, so they are pricing in uh, uh, very strong growth expectations. Uh, and I certainly think that uh, as growth recovers in the Indian economy, uh, these companies will be beneficiaries of uptick in the volume growth, but yet I think the valuations are pricing in a lot of those potential upsides. But uh, for cement, uh, do you think it's a better play on infrastructure rather than the core cap goods company? That's why that valuation uh, uh, difference, because over a period of time people have realized to play infra, it's better to own an Ultratech rather than an LNT? Yeah, that's been the case over the last few years, but I think as we see an uptick in the economy and we, uh, you know, we see recovery in the growth in the economy, I think some of these uh, engineering companies uh, have very strong uh, businesses and I think they'll do well. Right. Within the infra, uh, Pankaj, could you just be a little more specific? There are a lot of sectors, you know, people can look at defense, roads, ports. Uh, can you just be a little specific in which sectors uh, within infra do you think uh, the pickup will happen first? So roads has been doing exceedingly well over the last two or three years and probably should continue to do well. Uh, on the other infra segments, we haven't seen a meaningful uptick in the last uh, few years. <coughs> uh, 
uh, essentially uh, uh, ports or uh, you know in terms of uh, we haven't seen any new greenfield project announcements uh, so the core capex private sector capex has uh, been elusive but uh, i think as we see a recovery in the growth over the next two or three years in india will pro uh, and that's primarily also because that we have some excess capacity in some of these sectors as the growth recovers in the economy and we close the output gap in the economy i uh, i see no reason why investment should not pick up in the economy but that's probably a couple of years uh, uh, away uh, but as that happens i think uh, the cap goods companies or the engineering companies should also do well uh, as far as defense is concerned i think while there have been a lot of uh, you know uh, initiatives which the government has taken at the policy level but it is yet to translate into meaningful business to uh, companies so i think while longer term uh, probably it's a great opportunity and uh, for the private sector in india but i think probably it's still some time away before we start uh, seeing the policy actions translates into uh, orders for uh, indian companies Pankaj, thank you so much for taking out time for us. Always good to get a perspective from you. Thank you so much. Thank you.